Hello, I'm Pastor Paul. Welcome to worship with us at Christ Church by the Sea in Newport Beach. Our theme this morning is going to be what it means to wrestle with God. So let's begin by saying together the call to worship. Hallelujah, Christ has risen from the dead. Hallelujah, God has vanquished evil and death. We need no longer be afraid. Hallelujah. God has sent the Spirit of Christ into our hearts. Hallelujah. The Spirit has called forth a new people from out of every nation and race. We are the church, called to be Jesus' disciples in every place and time. We are the church, called to proclaim the good news in every language and culture. We are the church, called to be a new community of a new humanity. We are the church, called to be a sign of hope to all the world. Hallelujah! God has made all things new through Christ. Hallelujah! God has forgiven our sin and called us to new life in Christ. Thanks be to God, our Creator and our Redeemer. Amen. And now let us join our hearts together and sing our opening hymn.
We have two passages from the scripture this morning, both from the Old Testament. The first is from the book of Genesis. The same night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maids and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the river Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, that is, one who strives with God. For you have striven with God and with human beings and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, that is, the face of God, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle, that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. Our second passage of scripture is from the prophet Hosea. Jacob strove with God. He strove with the angel and prevailed. Here end the readings.
sure you've all heard of the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel. It's one of the classic stories of the Old Testament. In our weekly online Bible study, we've been working our way through the great stories of the book of Genesis. And this particular story jumped out at me again upon rereading it a few weeks ago because it is so intriguing and suggestive, and yet it is so puzzling, almost like a riddle. For starters, who is it exactly that wrestled all night long with Jacob? The narrator of the story in Genesis says it was a human being, a man. The text says, a man wrestled with him until daybreak. The prophet Hosea, however, says it was an angel. He strove with the angel and prevailed. But Jacob himself says that it was God. I have seen God face to face. But actually, we don't need to decide this question. All three are correct. Jacob wrestled with a man who was an angel. And in the Bible, angels are messengers or manifestations of God. That's why Hosea, who says that Jacob wrestled with an angel, can also say in the very same breath, Jacob strove with God. As a result of this unexpected encounter with God, Jacob was both wounded and blessed. Although his injury left him with a limp, he was a changed man who was given a new name that reflects his transformation. The mysterious messenger from God says to him, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, that is, one who strives with God. For you have wrestled with God and have prevailed. The name Israel means one who wrestles with God. Jacob's new name, Israel, later became the name of the nation of the Jewish people. And our Old Testament, which is the Jewish Bible, is the story of the wrestling of the Jews with God and of God with the Jews. Since our Christian faith comes from this heritage of Jewish faith, Christians have often understood themselves as a new Israel. But whether old or new, Israel is a collective term meant to designate all of God's covenant partners who commit themselves to wrestling with God, since God has promised to wrestle with them. So the question I want to ask this morning is whether you have ever wrestled with God or thought that God was wrestling with you. Of course, when we ask a question like this, we are using the word wrestling here in a non-literal sense. But our story itself invites us to do so. While Jacob was literally wrestling with a man, in another but far more profound sense, he was actually wrestling with God. Think about how we use the word wrestling in a non-literal or figurative sense. Often, for example, when people seek me out for pastoral care, they will say something like, Pastor, I have really been wrestling with a difficult issue in my life. Or they might say, I've been grappling with a hard decision. When we speak of wrestling or grappling in this figurative sense, we mean that we are struggling deeply with something, a problem, a decision, or a question that's really important to us. And to use the imagery of wrestling in this context is quite appropriate because wrestlers have to throw themselves entirely into the contest. When we are on the ground or on the mat wrestling with an opponent, we have to be fully present. Hence, when we wrestle with a question or an issue or a problem, we aren't merely interested in it or curious about it. We are completely engaged with it. So let me pose our question again. Have you ever wrestled with God or thought 
perhaps that God wants to wrestle with you. I wonder how many of us, though, ever dare to think of our relationship with God using this image of a wrestling match. I suspect that most of us would be reluctant to do so because we've been taught to be more passive in our relation to God, to submit humbly to God's sovereign will and overwhelming power. The idea of wrestling with God may seem a bit irreverent to us. And besides, what's the point? Who can possibly win a wrestling match with God? Isn't it better just to admit defeat and throw in the towel from the outset? Nonetheless, as I continue to study the Bible, I am repeatedly surprised by how often we human beings are invited, challenged, and encouraged to think about our relation to God in these terms. We are invited, challenged, and encouraged to become God's partners in dialogue and to push back, so to speak, when God doesn't make sense to us. I think, for example, of the time when Abraham took God to task for planning to destroy the entire city of Sodom. Abraham dared to call into question God's judgment. He said, Will you indeed destroy the righteous with the wicked? Shall not the judge of the entire earth do what is just? Perhaps some of us may be surprised to read that in response, God did not punish Abraham for his insolence. Instead, God yielded to Abraham's plea because God recognized in Abraham a worthy sparring partner. And we all know of the case of Job who demanded to have his day in court with God. Job, who had lost everything, protested his innocence. So he insisted on his right to cross-examine God to see whether God really rules the world with justice. In the end, God doesn't slay Job, but vindicates him, even while reminding Job that God's ways are beyond human comprehension. In the case of Jacob, the angelic wrestler declares to Jacob, you have wrestled with God and you have prevailed. Imagine that, not only wrestling with God, but prevailing. In this situation of the pandemic in which we now find ourselves, my hunch is that many of us are spiritually stuck in a limbo of sorts, feeling trapped existentially and not knowing how to move forward in our relationship with God or with ourselves. There's such a combination of anxiety and boredom that many of us simply don't know what to do with ourselves anymore. But the Bible has a solution to our problem. The Bible's solution to our predicament is to invite us to wrestle with God. So let's explore this a bit further by bringing two other voices into this conversation. An important American theologian named H. Richard Niebuhr who taught at Yale Divinity School for many years, once wrote a very important line that has been etched on my mind ever since first reading it. Niebuhr wrote, God is acting in all actions upon you. Let me repeat that. God is acting in all actions upon you. That means that Whatever else is going on in your life or my life, at any given moment of time, God is always also acting upon us. In other words, God is never not doing something with us. God isn't sitting far off in heaven, but is here and now acting upon us, you and me. 
in everything that I experience or you experience, in every encounter that I have or you have, God is acting upon you and me. If God is acting upon us in every moment, then our task is to discern what God is doing with us. That may be a very hard and difficult thing for us to do, and we may not always have much clarity about it. But that's where the wrestling comes in. If we believe, as Christians do, that God is always doing something with us at every moment and in every situation of our lives, then we must try to discern what it is that God is doing and how to respond to God accordingly. This process of spiritual discernment that consists in asking the questions, what is God doing in my life and what is God requiring of me at this time, may be as strenuous and exhausting as wrestling all night with an angel. We may feel that we don't have the energy for it. We may feel that We'd rather sit this round out, but we can't. We don't ever take a vacation from our relationship with God, because God never takes a vacation from us. God is always up to something in our lives, and it's up to us to respond to what God is doing in our lives. Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychiatrist who was sent to Auschwitz during World War II. There he discovered that the most important truth about human beings is that we need a meaning in our lives, no matter how dire our external circumstances may be. In the stark reality of a Nazi concentration camp that was designed to dehumanize its victims, Frankl observed that those prisoners who found meaning in their lives were the ones who survived, whereas those who lost all sense of meaning and purpose did not survive. As he put it, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. After the war, Frankel took this insight into the importance of spiritual meaning in our lives and made it into the cornerstone of his own distinctive approach to psychotherapy. He believed that at the root of most of the suffering he encountered in his patients was a lack of meaning in their lives. He realized that many persons in our affluent materialistic society are spiritually empty inside. As he said, Ever more people have the means to live, but no meaning to live for. Frankel wisely understood that it wasn't his job to tell them what the meaning of their lives was. They had to discover that for themselves. As their psychotherapist, he was there to help them as they wrestled with that question. As he said, each person is questioned by life. And each one of us can only answer that question with our lives. But that means that each of us has to be willing to wrestle with the question of meaning that life poses if we ever hope to answer it. We have to be willing to get off the couch and onto the mat in order to throw ourselves into the contest with everything we've got. The Christian theologian Niebuhr calls us to respond to God's action upon us. The Jewish psychiatrist Frankel calls us to answer the question of life's meaning. In their distinctive ways, both of them are inviting us to wrestle with God, just as Jacob did. Wrestling with God may be hard at times, and we always risk getting wounded in the process. But the Bible promises that we will surely be blessed if we take the risk 
and dare to wrestle with our God. For God didn't create human beings in God's very own image with the capacity for critical and thoughtful questioning just to have us grovel in the dust before God. God created us to be wrestling partners who respond in each moment to God's actions upon us, thereby answering the question of life's meaning with our very own lives. Jacob's wrestling with the angel has sometimes been likened to the experience of the dark night of the soul of which mystics have spoken. Even if you have never experienced this yourself, just the sound of it is enough to sh send shivers down your spine. Dark night of the soul? That's an experience of despair. Why would anyone risk that? Why would a minister suggest to his parishioners that they contemplate going down a road that might lead to despair? Well, what's the alternative? The alternative is not wrestling with God, not responding to God's action upon you, not answering the question of meaning that life poses to you. Each one of us is free to choose this option and not take this risk. We can play it safe. We won't find ourselves wounded and walking with a limp for the rest of our lives as Jacob did. But then we will spend our lives on the surface, never exploring the depths of our lives keeping ourselves amused and distracted so that we don't have to face the existential questions that we so want to avoid. Who am I? Why am I alive? What is my purpose? To whom and for what am I accountable? To what mysterious power do I owe my existence? If we choose to go down this route, however, we will find ourselves like Frankel's patients, empty inside, with the means to live, but no meaning to live for. But if we muster the courage to wrestle with God, what then? Yes, we might pass through a dark night of the soul, as mystics and other religious figures before us have reported, and yet, sometimes we come out of that dark night of the soul stronger than before, with a new faith that has been tested by the fires of doubt and anguish. Having probed the depths of our souls in the presence of God, we are ready to resume our lives in the world though now we are not quite the same persons we were before. While we may have been wounded by our wrestling, we find to our surprise that we have also been blessed. Like Jacob, we are both wounded and blessed by our wrestling match with God. In Genesis, we are told that Jacob was left alone before he met the mysterious angel who wrestled with him throughout the night. The quest to find the meaning in every unique human life is something that must be done by each one of us alone. No one else can do it for us. Just as Jacob had to be left alone before his divine wrestling match could begin, so too we must be left alone if we would wrestle with God in earnest. What if we turned off our televisions and our cell phones and our internets for 24 hours just to sit still with ourselves and God? Could we bear it? In this society, with so many ways to distract us from facing the existential question, by keeping us forever amused and entertained, even in the midst of a pandemic, 
Could we forego all that external stimulation even for one night so that we might come face to face with the ultimate contender who challenges us to the wrestling match of a lifetime? After he has been wounded in the struggle, Jacob refuses to let go of the angel until he has been given a blessing. Upon hearing Jacob's request for a blessing, the angel asks him, what is your name? Now, if the angel is God or God's representative, he must surely already know what Jacob's name is. So this can't be a genuine request for information, can it? What then is going on? Perhaps the question is a challenge. By asking Jacob his name, the angel is actually asking him, who are you? Who are you really? How well do you know who you truly are? And by being given a new name, Jacob is given a new self-understanding, a new insight into who he really and truly is. The angel says to him, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have wrestled with God and you have prevailed. Jacob's new name goes hand in hand with the blessing he has requested. You see, in the Bible, a name is not a mere label, but a sign or a symbol of a person's character or calling. To be called Israel means that Jacob is now a new person who is confident that he has wrestled with God, but wasn't crushed or destroyed by the experience. Was he wounded? Yes, he was wounded, but he was blessed as well. When Jacob asked the angel for a blessing, what he got was a question, what is your name? The blessing itself was to be found in the question. What is your name? What is your identity? Who are you? Who have you been? Who can you become? This is the question God is asking each one of us. Who are we? What is the meaning of our lives? As any good pastor or psychotherapist knows, the right question, asked at the right time, by the right person, can change a person's life, enabling to see and understand themselves in an entirely new light. The blessing Jacob received was found in the question he was asked. And the same is true of each of us. If we want a blessing, we will have to wrestle with the question of who we are. Because in every minute of our lives, God is acting upon us and is waiting for our response. God is questioning us and is listening for our answer. We are in the grip of God. Amen. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Our God, glorious and gracious, merciful and mighty, you have called us into being and placed us in your world. You surround us on all sides so that we cannot escape your presence and your demand. You are acting upon us in each moment of our lives and calling us to respond. You are questioning us to give an answer for the meaning of our lives. With the constant reminders of suffering and injustice at every turn, you call us to be responsible participants in your world, since we know that ultimately we must answer to you for our treatment of others. Hear our prayers, O God, and transform our world beginning with us. Forgive us our sins and show us ourselves as we truly are. 
Comfort the afflicted, O God, and afflict the comfortable. We thank you for our church and its mission and ask that you would strengthen and empower us to be Jesus' faithful disciples in these challenging times so that we might be a neighbor to those in need and a light to those in darkness, teaching others to pray just as Jesus has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, at this time I want to express my gratitude on behalf of our congregation for your financial gifts in supporting our ministry. They mean an awful lot to us, and we ask that you continue to remember our church in your giving. I also want to extend our invitation of pastoral care to all who are in need, even if you're not a member of this church. At the end of our worship service, you will see the contact information up on the screen. Please do not hesitate to contact us and we will be sure to reach out to you. And now let us join our voices and our hearts as we sing our concluding hymn. service to a close. Let us remember how we began. At this time of pandemic, when there is both great anxiety and great boredom, the Bible offers us a way out, and that is wrestling with God, which is also wrestling with ourselves. God is seeking us out God is seeking us out so that we can become more than we already are. Just as God gave Jacob a new name and a new identity, God wants to do the same for us. If we're willing to take that risk of wrestling with God, we just might find the blessing that we so desire at this time. And now let us receive the benediction. May our God, who raised Jesus from the dead for our sakes, send us forth in the power of the Holy Spirit to be the church, called out from every nation and race to be God's people, a light to the world and the salt of the earth. May our God, who so loves the world, empower us to do what is good, to seek justice, to comfort the afflicted, 
and to liberate the oppressed. May our God, who will never abandon us, grant us the peace that passes all understanding and keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And now, let us be Jesus' faithful disciples, trusting God to guide us through every circumstance and living in the joy and freedom of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. Yo no.